I'm super cute, super fun, and I'm also a leader. Let's go, ladies! Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Chile Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Hella Chile. And today we have a special guest uh, based out of Providence, Rhode Island. She's featured on this season's Hell's Kitchen on Fox with the world famous Gordon Ramsay. Without further ado, I would like to welcome to the show, Miss Bryn Gibson, Chef Bryn Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to do this. I've Always been wanting to start my own podcast and be on one, and here we are. Oh, I think you'd be great. Uh, thank you for uh, you know taking your time out of your day to talk to me, and um, I think you'd be a great podcast. I was, uh, I just actually watched the recent episode, and uh, you have a great personality. You're well spoken, and um, you just be yourself, and a lot of emotion on the episode. I'm like, dang, this is. I watched, I watched all the way through. Like, I got, I got pretty heated, but I'm like, I don't want to give too much. But I, you guys should just check out um. Hell's Kitchen, for those that watch uh, cooking shows or just reality shows, I think um, this is a good uh, episode to uh, to watch. I mean, a good season to watch. And um, also, like, you know, Bryn has a Vietnamese and Khmer background. So I definitely want to learn about you. I have my friend actually like, yo, check out this chick on uh, Hell's Kitchen. So I'm like, I DM'd her. Shoot my shot. So like, <laughs> And I was, I was really surprised you responded. I'm like, Wow. This yeah, is awesome. I really quickly. I was so excited. I was like, yeah. yo, this is so dope. I was like, finally, like, not just questions about, like, Hell's Kitchen. It was, like, questions about, like, me as a person and, you know, how I got to where I am and stuff like that. And I was like, I have to go for this. I have to. And, like, I, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, our social anxieties and stuff like that. Right. Um, but I definitely think it helps open up and it helps create an uncomfortable dialogue that also creates a safe space. So it's like, you're able to talk about things that I think people normally wouldn't. So I was just like, you know what? F this, let's try it. And here we are, and I'm so excited. Thank you. Let's get right into it. Absolutely. Tell us about yourself. Like, where were you born and raised and um, stuff like that? So I was born in Cambodia. We actually don't really know where, which is really crazy. Um, I was adopted out of uh, an orphanage in Phnom Penh. Um, when I was about 10 months old. And so I was actually raised in America. Um, so I was only in Cambodia for 10 months of my life. And then um, I was raised in the DMV right outside of DC. And um, I was adopted into an all-white family. Uh, my two parents have a biological uh, biological son, my older brother. There was never like a moment where I was just like, oh, like, you're adopted, surprise. I was always just like, I don't look like you people. <laughs> um, I think it was one of those things that like, I always knew um kind of that it, it was just again it was never a surprise there was never like a sit down moment of like hey you're adopted but they were very open and honest with me with like you know we don't know a lot about your history we don't know a lot about your medical history which is huge it happens all the time now to me when I go to the doctors oh what is there do you know your past medical history and I'm like no <laughs> um but you know my parents did the best they could to try to keep me in touch with my cultural roots. I did Cambodian dance um, for a couple of years and I didn't like love it. <laughs> um, I was always like a male part because I'm really tall. And so that was like not super fun. But I think that's one of the things that kind of opened my eyes to the Khmer culture was we would sit down for lunch. And that's when we would have traditional Khmer food, Vietnamese food and it was like food that I've never experienced because like you know my parents are white they don't necessarily know traditional Khmer food and so that was one of those moments of like whoa whoa like this is cool this is good <laughs> awesome yeah I actually did a Cambodian dance too the traditional dancing growing up so but I actually loved it like as with I was doing it with my friends and stuff so and I was like probably like 11 12 years old so it's yeah, pretty fun I was, I was, I was young. I ended up actually meeting, um, there was another girl who was adopted from my same orphanage living in the same state. And we ended up at the same dance troupe together, which was crazy. Like wow. the odds of that happening. Um, and that was pretty crazy, but she actually was able to have a photo of herself and her mother. Um, unfortunately I have just, again, zero ties other than the one photo I have from the orphanage, no ties of like what anybody looks like or however many siblings they have and stuff like that. Wow. Just off, but I was told I have a couple of siblings. Again, we don't know what information is true or not. 
Wow. Do you have any like interest in like trying to reach out to your your fam in Cambodia or yeah, in the future? Yeah, I think the yeah, like the issue is though is like it's still so like not technology advanced. There's no like advancement in the technology since I was adopted. I think there is some, but the likelihood of one of my siblings getting their hands on an electronic is very slim. But I did do a 23 and Me. So I'm able to see like if people do the tests and I think right. there's like a close third cousin. But uh, other than that, I think it would kind of be a wasted effort if I were to like really indulge in trying to find out my roots, right. like my family. Right. So and um, you you so you've been in Providence this whole time. You 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 were raised there or? No. So I was actually I was raised in D.C. in Vienna, Virginia. And then um, I ended up coming up to Providence about four ish, five years ago for college. And I have made it home. Um, you know, it was one of those things like I'm definitely a homebody. So wherever I start to set out roots and I started to set out roots here and I love Providence. It's such a great little foodie town. It's definitely up and coming. And so I figured, you know, why not try to start here? Shout out to Providence. I have yet to visit. Um, I go to Lowell a lot and stuff, and the Khmer culture, the the community is pretty big, so the food is really good over there. But I heard Providence has like a few Cambodian restaurants I want to check out. If I'm in town, I'll hit you up. We'll have some yeah. Khmer food, a mukbang or something. <laughs> if you're down, I would be so down. I'd be so excited. Yeah. So, um, do you have any like hobbies or like uh, hidden talents besides a? Uh, I played the piano. Um, oh, <laughs> I dope. actually so you just, I played the piano for a long, long time. I don't have hobbies. I like reading, cooking. Cooking, <laughs> that's reading. That's a hobby, even yeah. though I do that for a living. Uh, <laughs> other than that, really, no. I don't really. I'm kind of like a rinse and repeat kind of person. I live a pretty mundane life, but I love it. Um, but no, I don't really do a lot of like extra activities because my schedule is so busy between work and then. So, like, I work as a nanny, sometimes, like, 11 hours a day. And so then I get home, and then I'm, like, doing stuff for my dumpling business. Yeah, I decided to start a business, which was crazy. So a lot of my energy goes into that, so I don't really have time for, like, hobbies. Gotcha. What made you want to become a chef? Ooh, I don't really know. There was never, like, one, like, yes, I'm, I'm going to be a chef. It was just, like, I saw how food brought my family together at, like, the dinner table, I saw how food brought kids together at lunchtime and like also how food segregated people. Um, and just like, so the power that food had when it came to social dynamics really interested me. And then I was, you know, and that was like as a kid and then I like got good at cooking. And as I like kind of explored more into the um, culinary world, I really realized how intimate it is when you're able to prepare something with so much love and passion and you care and you care about who you're feeding and where you're, produce and like where you're sourcing your ingredients from that that's huge and that's something that's so as I said intimate to share with somebody and I was just like I want to do that like I just loved how cooking I could see how happy it made people and how like on a rainy day a good bowl of pho for me like makes everything better and so it's one of those things of just like like I wanted to do that and I wanted to create a safe environment a loving environment for people and I could do that the easiest way through food. So, yeah, and I wouldn't really call myself a chef. Now. I always have that issue. It's like, I guess people call it imposter syndrome. Um, <laughs> I, Why do you say I that? Really, <laughs> I'm like, I'm a cook. I, I love cooking, but like, I don't know. For me, chef is someone that like creates change. Like you hear chefs of like, you know, Chef Ramsay, he has his own empire. They did the whole thing. And I'm just like, oh, like I cook. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's it's getting interesting um, calling myself a chef now. Well, you're Chef Bryn. And um, tell us Bryn. about your journey and how did you get on like Hell's Kitchen? What was that like? How was that process like? It was weird because I'm in a Facebook group and it was like line cooks old and new or something. And it was just like, you know, a group of like 120,000 people. And I was commenting a lot because, you know, I was kind of going through it in college. I was working and I was like feeling like I was overworked and underpaid um, at a job that I had. And like, you know, I was stepping up and taking on more responsibility. And like, I just wasn't being appreciated as a person. And I would go on to this, this group and be like, I hate this. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> 
or I would post um, photos from culinary school and I'd say, hey, this is how I plated this dish. Like, and I was, I was just super active in the group. And then someone, one of their scouting people just reached out to me and they're like, hey, like, oh, I'm a casting person for Hell's Kitchen. We'd love to like interview you. And I was like, this is fake, fake. Mm-hmm. I was like, what? And it was crazy because I was like, no, like, whatever. And so um, I kind of called her, like I called them out on it. And I was like, oh, this is so fake. Like, there's <laughs> no way. And then so I ended up calling the company and it was legit. I got on the Zoom and then from there just like took off and then i was on tv wow so that uh, you had to go to vegas for that right the yes the we film. filmed in vegas we filmed right off the las vegas strip and it was the second time i've been to vegas the first time i was like 13 and wow. it kind of sucked because i was 13 and there was like nothing you can do <laughs> but um no it was definitely hell's kitchen was such an eye-opening experience and i would do it all over again if i could wow i still never been to vegas and um <laughs> What what was your experiences like during the process? Like, um, what, what are some some challenges you face? Well, as everybody knows, I cry. <laughs> 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 well, um, and it's not that that was like one of the challenges. It wasn't the tears. It was the anxiety that I had. I had a lot of anxiety, and I had a lot of self doubt after getting on the show and meeting the people that apparently have been doing this for so long, and me being a prep cook. Like, I know my title says line cook, but I'm like. I didn't have really any brigade experience. So I was never working where I had to make sure like timing, it wasn't really a timing thing. I was always a prep cook. I was like, it was more so my timing aspect was how, how many tasks can I complete in this designated amount of time? It was never like the burger needs to be medium rare when the salad goes out and that steak needs to be well done. So it was intimidating and my anxiety through the roof the entire time. I was trying to process everything. And unfortunately, right before I had been put on the show, I started developing panic attacks. Mm -hmm. And it scared me even more being on TV with a panic attack because like I could barely control them as is. So then like leading into it, I was like, I have to, I have to control it. I cannot show people that I have anxiety. I can't. And so it was one of those things of like, no, it's, it's who you are. Anxiety is a part of who you are. Like I have a physiological chemical imbalance that I can't control. And it's one of those things of just like, why take more effort hiding it rather than just owning it? And so that was one of the things of like, I had to always think, do I risk looking like an idiot, like a crybaby, like I want attention, like, and how people are going to take it. Are they going to say it's fake? Are they going to say I'm doing it for the views for the show? And at the end of the day, I just had to say like, F that, like, I'm sorry, like, fuck this. Like I'm, people can take it how they want. My anxiety is true to me, whether you believe it or not, that's fine. But I also knew that there are other people struggling with it too. And so I was just like, just take deep breaths and get through it. And it's meant to be how it's going to be. <laughs> um, but other than that, you know, just dealing with big personalities also kind of tough for me because sometimes I do feel as though I come off across as an alpha and it's sometimes hard for me to be a beta. And so that was something that I had to adjust to. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I feel like um, I needed to hear that. I do have anxiety as well. You're on TV, you're on camera, and you have, it looks hectic in there. So I'm like, dang, you do your thing, though. Like, you're, you're being yourself, which I, I really admire. You know, the crying, all that stuff is, like, needed for for a show like that yeah. because we see the real, we see the raw, you know? Yeah, exactly. And And for everyone saying that those shows are scripted, absolutely not. Nothing is scripted. It's all how we feel how like we react the way we react like not to give away last episode but like when I ragefully cried that wasn't like oh like cry but be angry it was like I hit a switch because Mm. I was so pissed off and I went off and like that's how I felt in that moment and I felt like I needed to say that and that like everything in those moments that's like how we felt and we were all 100% with each other and that's what I loved about this group was it wasn't like oh, we're all young, so let's all be like, like, whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, let's be nice. It was all just like, no, you fucked up. Like, you messed up. Like, we're holding you accountable. And so, like, I do think we had, we also did have a different approach to certain things being young. But again, we did not take it easy on anybody. 
Um, and I don't think we ever pumped the brakes for anybody. There was like no excuses allowed. It was just like, why did this happen? And it was one of those things that like, you just had to have an answer. You had to be prepared and you had to like, also know you can't please everybody. You are competing for one job. Um, and there are eight, 18 of us. So I had to, I have to beat out 17 other people. Um, so it's one of those crazy mentality mindset things that you have to kind of sit in and absorb. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And um, what's it like working with like Gordon Ramsay? Do you get starstruck or is he cool in real life? Or? Yeah, I got so starstruck. <laughs> like, there's some times that he'd be like showing me how to do something. Uh, like I I really do forget what happened. Like sometimes on the show, <laughs> like I'll like watch it and I'll be like, oh yeah, that did happen. But I do recall sometimes he'd be either talking to me or doing something and I'd just be like, whoa, like, oh my God, like it's Chef Ramsay, like right here and now because I'm so used to watching him on TV and I'm just like, oh, like, snap out of it. He's telling you what to do. And then I'll be like, yes, chef. And then I'll look over at my teammate, like, what did they just tell me to do? Like, what am I supposed to be doing? <laughs> but um, I did try to keep my head in the game a lot. It was one of those, like, refocusing things um, that I had to be consciously aware of that, you know, yes, it's okay to be starstruck here and there. More so on rewards when you're not in the competition setting. But there were some times that I was just like, uh-oh, like... <laughs> gotta pull my head out of my ass and like gotta, <laughs> gotta keep the wheels moving yeah he's funny i i see him on tiktok and he's just like reacting oh, to people so it's funny hilarious now. yeah like, he was also like tweeting at people like he's doing hip. a tweet response <laughs> he was a savage um but no yeah. chef is honestly everything he does he does it with passion he does it because he cares so much about not just like food but just like the industry and where the industry is heading towards and where it came from and teaching us about how to, you know, I guess, continue the legacy of what cooking should be. And it was one of those things that like, I just have so much respect for him as a person that, yeah, I got starstruck a couple of times. <laughs> What's your favorite dish to make, uh, Bryn? Ooh, that's kind of hard. It's like one of those, like, it depends on the day. It depends on the week. Congee love it's super easy but i sometimes used to make it when i had leftover pho broth mm. and i throw that in instead of just like water and rice um i also love making pho i make mine for 72 hours like it has to be 72 hours roasting the bone like the, the whole real way <laughs> yeah like, my roommates are always just like it smells like pho and i'm like sorry it's going to you for the next week <laughs> um but I love making that because it's, it's again, those things that are like labors of love. Like Italians love making pasta because it's like, it's just something that like they love doing. For me, I love making it because it's how I get in touch with my my heritage and like my culture. And so that's why I'm like, it's one of those things where like I feel close to home, whatever home is. It just gives me that feeling of my ancestors did this and like I'm now doing this. And so that's why I love making pho and fungi. But I also do like, you know, the steaks um toasts like avocado toast for whatever reason super easy <laughs> but anything that's just like cooking i just love food i just really love food me too like kanji and pho like comfort food so it's like yeah you you mentioned you wanted to get in touch with your roots and um my audience is a lot of them are Khmer Americans and um mm -hmm. and it's cool to see that you are Khmer Vietnamese and um i just want to ask you like um what do you like most about being Asian American, specifically Khmer Vietnamese as well. I love the fact that our culture is so culturally diverse within our own culture. Like yeah. it's not just like Khmer. So like when I did my twenty three and me, and they told me where I was from, it was like Vietnam. But then it was also like Ho Chi. Uh, it was Hanoi and oh, I forget the other one. There was like two main places, but like I forget exactly where it was. But there was two like places, and then there was also like in Cambodia, there was multiple places. So it was like it's just Southeast Asia is such a melting pot, and I think I love that about the culture is that it you have bits and pieces. There's not just like one Vietnamese. Like I think a lot of people think, oh, you're Viet, and they put you in this box. Right. It's like oh, well, you have the people that live in the mountains. You have people that live in the lowlands. You have people that live in the city, and like they don't necessarily know. And whether it's they're being willfully ignorant or they're just uninformed. Um, but I think that's one of those, the beauty of it is that like, you can, like I can say like, I'm from Vietnam and they're just like, cool. But I know how much more significance there is when I say that. Right. Um, and, and more so, I love being like Asian American because 
now I have the ability to enlighten and inform others that don't know because, you know, I feel like sometimes, unfortunately, I fall more American than I do Asian. It's just how I was raised, the people I was surrounded myself with, the people like I was surrounded with as a child. Um, it's like all that stuff. I do think I kind of fall more American than Asian. And I think that now I'm able to learn more about the Asian culture and then like enlighten the people that I have surrounded myself with that don't know that are predominantly white and teach them about it. And I think there's like a beauty in that as well, because ignorance is something that kills cultures. It kills knowledge. It kills just like development. And however I can negate that, whether it's, you know, we were talking earlier about the whole stop Asian hate and all the hate crimes and that like, People like look at me and they're like, oh, you're American. Like you don't get affected. And it's like, but my, but my people do. And so trying to like, t- like teach them just that, that like, it's the same concept um, that people are like, and some people just like don't know. And that's like, I feel like it's my duty to inform people whether, whether or not they want to listen, that's on yeah. them. But it's an honor being Asian American. We spoke a few times about it on certain past episodes and stuff and it's like um it's been like a year more or more actually racism's been around forever but um the spike is the increase it's been more it's been more so publicized publicized like every Um, day something new on on social media footage like people getting stabbed or hit or and what makes me mad is like people not doing anything they're just, just watching it. They're just they're filming it more. You're like, dang. Yeah, when we were kids, there was always the bystanders. It's almost worse being a bystander because you could have stepped up to do something when someone's getting bullied. And, you know, as I was saying earlier, I do understand if there's, like, you know, knives being weld or guns being held. Like, it is harder to put yourself in harm's way. But at the end of the day, if you see an old woman or an old man getting beaten for no reason, and you're so, watching and you're filming and you're enabling, how can you... Then, like, because, like, again, we were saying people only care when it happens to their immediate circle. Right. If that was their grandparent, if that was their friend's grandparent or their cousin, like, whatever it may be, until until it hits home or a certain circle for them, people don't care. But that's one of those things of, like, in the Asian community, I think we see everybody as family. And it's it's tough knowing that things are happening and other people aren't stepping in when they should. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. You just got to... Do more. Yeah. Like, take action. Yeah. But again, you know, I do understand why some people in certain situations choose not to. Um, you know, again, if they're going to be put in immediate danger, it is tough. But if someone's being, if someone's helpless, like what, like if it was a puppy, I'm sure they would like go and stop the person and help right. save the puppy. So, like, exactly. But, oh, top yeah. of the world, let me go in a little. I think it's important. So, thank you for uh, your input on that. We have to do our our duties our as duties, agents yeah. and as citizens to talk about it. Because again, as I said earlier, it's one of those uncomfortable things that people don't want to talk about. But it needs to be said. Things need to a dialogue needs to happen in order for change to happen. Whether it's change in, in one year, in three months, in ten years, change needs to happen. And in order for that to happen, people need to talk. I agree. What is your biggest accomplishment, Bryn? My biggest accomplishment, well, I will say starting my own business. Um, I've started, since the pandemic, I have started a business called The Dumpling Den, where I sell handmade dumplings. I have two varieties. I have a vegan. So it's called OG Vegetarian because my dummy head didn't realize that it was also vegan. So I have a vegan option and I have OG pork. I'm currently working on a Korean barbecue chicken and a shrimp, a curry shrimp. So work on more flavors, but I would say that that's my biggest accomplishment just because it's scary. It's so scary because like everything could fail tomorrow. Um, I could lose so much if this doesn't take off or like all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's also one of those things of like, cool, this business failed. Let's go start another one. Um, I think pandemic, the pandemic shouldn't be an excuse to not it like, if anything, it should be the reason why you're taking risks. It should be the reason why you're leaving your job and you're starting, like, again, don't blame me if you just go and see me for jobs. <laughs> don't blame me for that. Mm-hmm. But um, 
I do think a lot of people missed out on taking a risk. And I always thought I was a straight line kind of, I needed a job and I needed to kind of follow the hierarchy of how society works. So you graduate, you get a job, you work, 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 whether it's a nine to five or whether you're in the industry or whatever it may be, then you have your family and then you do the whole thing. Um, yeah, no, I'm not, I just, for whatever reason, I was like, F that. And I am one person that is like, I love the same. I don't really like change. Um, I don't like risks. Um, but I, for whatever reason, I was just like, I can't keep, I don't like working for other people because I have realized not to toot my horn, but I don't necessarily get the acknowledgement I feel as though I deserve. I was working at two places before this. And at one point, I told my bosses, I was like, hey, I need a raise or else um, I need to get a second job. And I was in college. And they were like, okay, you can get a second job. And I was like, um, <laughs> what? Like, <laughs> did we? Um, and unfortunately, there were some things that happened and somebody else got a, a much bigger raise than I did. And I just finally said, I can't keep doing this. So then I left and I went to the other job and I was working there doing well. And I started demonstrating more leadership and more uh, abilities. And then again, it happened and I was like, Hey, I need to be making some sort of progress. I need to either be moving towards management or towards whatever, just making progress in some direction. Nope. Nope. And it was, I felt like I was getting used and abused. And I finally was just like, I'm done. Hmm. I need to work for myself because I can't be working with other people that don't respect me and with management that doesn't necessarily respect me or even acknowledge that I was working six days a week, practically three shifts on my own when the pandemic happened. And so it was one of those things of just like, how do I now position myself? And I was just like, let's just start making dumplings. Like I used to make dumplings just like, in, in passive for like friends and stuff. Um, and I never really took it seriously. I never was just like, Oh, I could profit. And then finally I was just like, Hey, I could profit. <laughs> <laughs> and I started folding and I, um, was talking to my friend about it. He reached out and he goes, Hey, you know, we do pop-ups here. Would you like to do a pop-up? And the first one was so successful. And I was so scared because I was just like, Oh my God, no one, no one wants a dumb. Like, I don't know. It was, you know, all those doubts that come into your head, but it was so well. And the crazy part is the last pop-up I had, not super good, but it's one of those things that like you take the good with the bad. And it's one of those things about starting a business that there are so many risks, but you just, you have to do it because if you don't, somebody else will. And then that's when you live in that. What if, and I hate living in that. What if? Same. So, uh, what's the name of your dumpling business? Congrats on that, by the way. Um, Thank you. So and let us know how we can support. So, as a community, so, yeah. Oh yes, as a community. I'm, I'm gonna send. I'm gonna send all. I'm gonna send all my people over there and be like, "Boom, we're here <laughs> um, for them dumplings." <laughs> all about the dumps. Um, so it's called the Dumpling Den. Um, I do. Fro- I deliver. I do frozen. I can do bulk ordering too. I can deliver them hot as well. Um, but I'm usually doing pop-ups at Fortnite on Matherson Street. It's the it's typically the last Tuesday of every month. I'm trying to get into other businesses. Follow my IG. You can follow my Instagram, which is like the food nugget. And then it should my uh, business is under that because it's called the dumpling den, but there's like periods in between each of the words because I guess yeah. somebody else had that name. But yeah, so how you can support honestly is just like sharing and liking it's one of those word to mouth things and coming out and supporting if you're in the um providence downtown area or even if you're not the people i nanny for Hmm. live like 30 45 minutes away and they've come to my pop-ups and um you know it's one of those things of like understanding that when you support a small business you're not supporting it's it's not like it's a i i used to be that person of why is it so expensive like why why am i paying this much for that when I could go on Amazon and order or what, you know, whatever it is. And I didn't realize until I became a small business owner of how important it is to support the small business community. And I'm so thankful that it opened my eyes to a new sort of thinking of just like, wow, like these, this is how people are making their livelihood to put their daughters in dance camp, to put their, like, to, like buy school supplies for their children. Like that's like those things that I don't think of like before this. And so, you know, how to support me is just, 
liking, sharing, trying to create that sense of community. But I am so thankful for the small community that I found myself in and the support that I have, whether it was like from the fans or whatever, but also just like the repeated customers. Good luck. I feel like you're going to do well. And um, let me know if you like come to New York with a pop up or do you plan on like going on the road like in if there's a demand for you, like, Ooh, let's I say you start know. popping off. Leo, we got to have you at a food I really festival. Want, <laughs> I really want to go uh, wholesale. I want to try to go and get into markets. And, mm. like, um, I want to try to do that. I'm scared. I'm very scared. <laughs> but I think I have I think I think have a good product. Um, and I definitely, I want to get into selling it, whether it's Walmart or BJ's or Costco let's or Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, whatever it may be. I think I want to go that route with it because that's how I can get more of myself out to more people. Nationwide, yeah. We can go to like Costco or Trader Joe's. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. It's called the Dumpling Den. The Dumpling Den. Follow uh, the Dumpling Den and the Food Nugget. I have have your info on the screen. And support. Yeah. Support small businesses as well. Support small businesses and support local. I'm all about supporting local as well. Definitely important. What is the best piece of advice you received, Bryn? My father. Love him to death. You learn more from failure than you do from success. And I will hold that so dearly to me because that is so true. I never really, because, you know, again, as I talk about imposter syndrome and I have, unfortunately, daily thoughts of, you're not going to make it. What if this fail? Like all those terrible, terrible thoughts that I'm sure hundreds of thousands of people have. Um, so I share that with people. Um, but I, I have those daily of just like, what if I don't make it? What if nothing comes out of it? And it's scary. But then I always hear him say, you learn more from failure than you do from success. And I'm like, that's how I keep going. Is that it's always a lesson to think of it as always a lesson that it's not just a stopping point. Just because you failed doesn't mean that you should stop. It just means that you need to take inventory, take stock of what you've been doing. And then you think of, okay, well, what didn't work? Why did it fail? And then you say, well, if I do this again, or if I start another business, how does this not happen? How do I change course and make it work? And so it put me in a new mindset that I don't think I would have had if you never said it to me. So you learn more from failure than you do from success. I will always say that. I love it. It's true. And what advice would you give to the, the next generation Oh God, I hate these like aspirational ones. I don't hate them though. I just, I'm like, I always get nervous because like, I don't want to give someone advice and then like bowls up in their face. But I would say, go for it. Push yourself, push your comfort zone. So as I said, I'm a creature of habit. I, I don't really change. I've been going to the same bar for five years. I don't change where I go. I like, I wear the same practical, like a t-shirt and shorts, like, or jeans, like all the time. Like I'm a, again, a creature of habit. I like what I like. I do what I do. But I do in small, in small doses, I change. I, I, I read a new book. I read a new type of book. I listen to a new type of podcast. I take a new free online course of something. Or, you know, I go and meet somebody new or like talk to new people or put myself in a situation where I'm not necessarily comfortable. Or like I go to a museum and I don't really like, well, like an art museum. Like I don't necessarily understand art, but like, I go and I'm just like, cool, like, isn't whether or not I like it, whether or not I enjoy it, whether or not I'm going to do it again, you're still broadening your horizons. So my advice to the new generation is, A, try to be open-minded. Whether or not you agree, it doesn't matter. You just need to hear the other person's point of view. You can still believe what you want to believe, but it's so important to listen because who knows, maybe you can't change your mind. But then the other thing is try new things go to new places, meet new people, do things that don't, you're not necessarily comfortable with and push your limits because you don't know your potential unless you're striving for it. So that's all my advice. That's great and valuable advice. Better than I would have given. So like, I'm, I'm like <laughs> you, when people ask me that question, I'm like, damn, what did I say? Like, oh, this is where I, I, I type my, my speech. Like, get, get a good breakfast? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's your Wheaties. <laughs> <It's> your Wheaties. <laughs> Um, Brynn, uh, uh, what is your, like, what's your ultimate goal? Ultimate goal? Like, like in, in what? Like in life? In life. In life. Ultimately. 
<laughs> I would love to be the next Gordon Ramsay in the sense, in the sense of I definitely passed like the, like he was getting Michelin stars at my age right now, so I've surpassed that. I mean, in the sense of I want the empire, I want the restaurant chains. Do I want to be running them? Not necessarily. I don't want to be like physically in there, but I want to be. I want to have hmm, different revenues of income. So mm, predominantly in the culinary industry, but like, I want it all. I want, that's like the easiest way to say it. I the want br- everything. The brand, I, the brand empire. And, um... Yeah, I want, I want the empire. I want the freedom. I work hard now because I'm buying my freedom later. So cookbooks or cooking utensils or selling product or creating product or developing product or creating factory, whatever it may be. I want my hands on everything because I feel like that's the best way to position yourself and how I can affect change in the future. Cause I want the younger generation to have opportunities. I want my kids, my future kids to be able to see like, it's possible. You just have to work hard. And like, that's the one thing that like, both of my parents, but like, I, I do feel like I got a lot of my work ethic from my father. He worked his ass off and he still does. Um, and you know, same way with my mother, but like, I know that my dad was working so much and I want my kids to see that too, that like, you have to work to get what you want. Cause it doesn't just appear on your lap. Um, but I also, I want to create change. I want to create safe spaces for people, places, whether it's a work environment, a safe work environment, or a place to go read and have a cup of tea or have a bowl of noodles or have some dumpling, like feeling like they have a place to go because I've known what it's like to feel very isolated and alone when you feel like you can't have a place to go. And it sucks. It absolutely sucks feeling alone. Like I like being alone. I hate feeling alone. (laughs) Um, and so ideally that's what I would want. I would want the empire so I can create change and enjoy life. Well, you have my full support and I'm rooting for you and I can't you. see, can't wait to see what, what's next with uh, Bryn. And, uh, oh, yeah, I have no idea what's next, <laughs> but I know I want a new project. So if you have anything in mind, let me know. New project. Oh yeah, definitely. Let's keep in touch. And, um, like I said, I have a the Cambodian community, and when we see our people on TV, we go we go <laughs> we go hard for our people. So it's like it's cool wow. to see you're an inspiration to to a lot of us and um, a role model. And Ooh. and then <laughs> how does that feel? How does it feel to be like shoot? I'm, I'm gonna have to be the president of the Bryn fan club. You know, start as far <laughs> fan pages. You know, you're gonna get to that level soon, and where you're like, oh shoot, Team Bryn. <laughs> oh, it's it's scary um when people are like oh you're an inspiration and you're this and you're that because I'm like I'm a person and I didn't know that I had that much power and that people people give things power it's like how it works I didn't know that I inspired people that I or that I had the ability I knew that you know I was good at what I did and like I felt like people would might like want to be like me if that makes sense like oh like I wish I had her driver whatever whatever it is but I never thought it would get to the point of you inspire me and my daughter and like I get these messages that are just like you speak about your anxiety and you own it and you're this and I'm like dude I was trying to hide that (laughs) (laughs) damn and so now it's just like I'm so thankful and I'm so grateful that I am able to be someone that people can see and that like you know, unfortunately, like my family wishes, I'm sure sometimes I'm a little bit more polished with how I present myself because I do know, you know, I, I want to be a professional at the end of the day, but I also want to be relatable and people that are too professional are not relatable. And that's the scary thing is like, there's some chefs that are just like, so on their high horse that like, yeah, you want to be like them, but like, you don't even know how to like fathom that and so I want to always be approachable that like people can come up and talk to me which is why like I am kind of casual with how I present myself because I want to be approachable and I want people to be able to like see me as a person and not just a tv figure and it's crazy it's so crazy though it's so <laughs> crazy to have people be like oh my god you're an inspiration I was like, <laughs> 23 and I don't know what I'm doing but thanks <laughs> 
<laughs> but what I like about you is your personality. You know, is you being yourself, like a hundred percent. You know, like you, like you said, it's not scripted, and everything you do is who you are. So that's uh, that's you know, I respect that. That was it. Was tough though. I'll be honest. Like growing up, I tried to fit in really hard, so I was putting on personas of trying to like fit in with the different crews, and I realized that isolated me so much more. So again, oh, well, I guess one other piece of advice would just be, no, be who you are, and like own who you are, and like people aren't people aren't gonna like you. It's just a thing. People don't like me, and I was like, cool, congrats. Like yep. I don't know what you want from me. <laughs> um, just like, and I think it's kind of crazy that people think that just because they don't like you, they're going to like get something out of it. But like, again, people aren't going to like other people. I don't like people and people don't like me. And I'm like, that's just how the world works. But that doesn't mean that you should try to fit in and try to be someone that they want to like, because then you lose who you are in the process. Um, But yeah, I know it's crazy. I agree. Be be yourself. That's all you can be. And don't try to please everybody. You can't please them you all. You have one life to live. Yeah. Whether I mean, whether or not you believe in reincarnation, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but like, in theory, you have one life to live. Don't waste it being somebody else because then you're going to get to be 30 and you're going to say, I wasted my youth trying to fit in and I don't talk to any of these people anymore. <laughs> yep. Thank you so much for your knowledge and your time and in sharing your experiences. I appreciate you so much, Bryn, and you have my full support. Um, to end this on a good note, any any last words, shout outs, or anything you want to promote? Shout out to my family. Um, I I love you guys. Thank you for supporting me. Shout out to my boyfriend. You have been. He's. I know with my anxiety sometimes it, it gets a little rough, but like, thank you to you too. Thank you to everyone that's been so supportive. My close friends, I know who they are. Like, fortunately, I have like three close friends. <laughs> but um, and just like also, thank you to you. Thank you for having me on and being able to share you know, my side of my story. Cause I think unfortunately a lot of people see what they see on TV and they'll make those judgments. Um, and they don't, again, they don't hear out why I acted the way I did or why I said what I said or why I behaved in that certain manner. And so, um, people are, it's just easier to judge and it's just easier to say like, this is what makes me feel comfortable. This is what I want to think. I'm not going to change my mind. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on certain topics that like, you know, I wouldn't necessarily just fully come out and talk about um and opening up a, a new dialogue for me and this is scary as we said about anxiety and stuff and like wanting to put the best foot forward shout out to just everyone that's been in my corner not necessarily my circle because just because you're in my circle doesn't mean you're in my corner but okay. shout out to everybody that's been in my corner um it means so much because you guys believe in me on the days that i don't and i need that and make sure you guys tune in to hell's kitchen and keep an eye on uh Chef Brynn and root for her because uh, Chef Brynn <laughs> <yo. laughs> Yeah Alright Thank you so much and I'll Thank see you, you At the top Yes you will <laughs> <laughs>